Good morning. Welcome, Bethel family. We greet you in the name of Jesus. And uh, my prayer right now is that the presence that is in this house would flow into your house where you are right now. Beloved Benjamin, we're talking about the Benjamin generation. We're talking about a season of ear-tingling events. Ear-tingling events are events that only God can produce. And we've been looking at examples, but we are dealing with Benjamin, the 12th son of Jacob. And we are in a series called the Benjamin Generation because I believe that this generation that is rising up now, regardless of age yet, in terms of content, is a generation of grace, truth, time, and power. A great blending, a balance. And this morning, I, I want to read for you. I, I have so much on my heart. The first thing I wanted to say today is, when I was 17 years old, a beautiful man named Dick Mills prophesied over my life. And he gave me life words that I've hung on to. I'm 62 now. Did you know God will reach you young sometimes with the headlines? But his performances of his promises are always greater than his promises. So usually there are a few detours involved. <laughs> but one of the verses he gave me that I've never been able to shake is Hebrews 2, 4. He said, I'm going to confirm the words you speak with signs, wonders, and diverse gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And it was an imagery of me preaching and then him confirming. And beloved, I can study and I can do the best that I can with what he's given me. But I cannot confirm that word with signs and wonders and diverse gifts of the Holy Spirit. Only he can. So I was just crying out to him this week, Lord, confirm the word with signs and wonders following. So I just want you to be sensitive today that I can only deliver the word you have to receive it in your heart, and then we pray by grace in union together that he will confirm the word with both signs and wonders and different gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So I just pray, Father, for my beloved brother and sister right now, Lord, that you would comfort their hearts, that you would open their souls, Lord, that you would come as you always do as fresh dew and oil, that you would anoint our hearts and moisten them too, that you would cause, Lord God, the tears of a lifetime that need to be surfaced to begin to surface safely. And with those tears, that you would bring healing and, and deliverance unparalleled in our personal lives. And we ask your blessing upon your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you, beloved. Oh, my Deuteronomy 33, 12. Let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for, his shield, for he shields him all day long. And the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. These are the words of Moses to the tribe of Benjamin. Oh, beloved, God is about to move. And he's about to move in a profound way. And I think that as we go a little bit deeper into our series today, we've talked about how the Benjamin generation is the generation of the beloved, the generation that knows that their identity is not in what they can do, not in what they have, not in what other people say they are, but their identity is rooted profoundly in the fact that they are the beloved of the Lord on whom his favor rests. And we pointed out to you that both Joseph and Benjamin had the same father and the same mother. Remember? The two blood brothers of all the brothers are about to be united. And I want to read you an extensive amount of text today, but I want to just give you a helicopter view of what's going on. Benjamin is about to be released by Jacob so that he can find his destiny meeting Joseph. And did you know we found last week and in the past three weeks, sometimes we hold tenaciously onto something that God is requiring us to let go of. Do you remember God said to Abraham, let go of Isaac? Because as good a blessing as Isaac was, 
He had subtly become an idol in the heart of Abraham. And Isaac was now sitting on the throne of Abraham's life, a place only God is meant to sit upon. And sometimes the Lord will call us to give up the very thing he's promised us as a living sacrifice upon his altar. Because he must have the primary place in our hearts few months ago we did a teaching on idols and idols are not evil things they're good things but our focus shifts from God to them do you see how <laughs> the devil never used he never tempts you with a maggot ridden meat mm, would you like some of this no no it's always a good thing a delicious thing an amazing thing that we put as the first thing and then God is dethroned and all of a sudden before you know it Isaac, who is intending, God intended Isaac to be the, the one who would produce the seed of the messianic line, becomes a little idol to Abraham, and Abraham and is told, give him to me, give, it, give him back, give him back, because not even my promise will be allowed to block our I, thou, subject to subject, face to face communication. And in this case, Jacob is holding Benjamin. He has every right to do it. He has lost everything in his life. The only shred of what reminds him of Rachel is Benjamin. He, he thinks Joseph is dead for 22 years, and his miserable sons haven't been much of an encouragement. And may the Lord bless all the miserable sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, amen. The, sh the only shred he has of Rachel is Benjamin. And the Bible says that he was leaning on Benjamin. Benjamin had to help him go to the bathroom. Benjamin had to help him get up to go eat. Benjamin, you don't know how valuable a good right hand is until you need that right hand person in your life and you can't function without them. And loved one, this is a season where the father is calling together Joseph and Benjamin, those he can lean upon. Can God lean upon you with his full weight of grace, power? Can he lean upon you in trust and confidence? Because the glory that is going to be revealed, if, if, if you cannot be leaned upon, would crush you to death. I remember a great preacher of our time said a young man came up to him and said, Oh, I'd love, oh, pastor, I'd love to have twice of your anointing. I'd love to have a double portion of your anointing. And the pastor, realizing how much this has cost him over the years in suffering, about 45 years, did you know salvation by grace through faith is free, but everything else comes at a price? And as Catherine Kuhlman used to say from this very pulpit, if you want to know what it costs, it costs everything but it's worth everything. Can the Father lean on you? Well, here, Jacob has every valid logical reason to not want to release Benjamin because last time he released his favorite child, the child was killed, so he thinks. But sometimes we can find ourselves, whatever our intentions, holding on to something so desperately, a person, a place, a thing, an idea, that it's killing us. And Jacob was no longer protecting Benjamin from anything. He was protecting his own heart from further despair. But isn't it interesting? Benjamin is the key to Jacob's future victory. If he doesn't release Benjamin, the 11th son, to go to Egypt and meet Joseph, those 11 stars are not going to be in front of Joseph bowing down. And that's the fulfillment of Joseph's dream. Isn't it funny? It's in Jacob's arms temporarily to decide whether or not he's going to allow his own dreams to be fulfilled. Can you, isn't this a strange dichotomy, can you be holding on to the very thing and choking it to death that is the thing you have to let go in order for it to get where it needs to get so that you can be blessed? Because Benjamin's release, and by the way, he does release Benjamin. Thank God. And Benjamin does, like a dove, fly to his place 
in the presence of Joseph. And I'm, I'm going to read that text in a moment. And then Benjamin's appearance, the Benjamin generation, when it appears, releases blessing in every direction, including Jacob's release into the last 17 years of his life of domestic bliss in Goshen. Can it be that we're holding on to the very thing unto death that we're supposed to let go so it can find its place, so that key can open the door for our freedom? Isn't that strange in the kingdom? The way up is the way down. The way down is the way up. If you hold on to it, you lose everything. If you let go, you gain everything. Isn't You know when someone's following Jesus because <laughs> they become adept in the upside-down kingdom. <laughs> I know many of you, and I know you're comfortable with it now. You know his ways. You know, the longer you live with someone, the more you know their ways. You don't need to. No one else understands, but you get it. You get it. And that's the way we are walking with Jesus. We know it. If you want to lose it, give it up. If you want to. <laughs> what? Huh? What? Proverbs eleven twenty four. If you want to hold tight to it, you lose it like a bar of soap. If you keep an open hand, it'll flow right through. You'll always have enough. You're, these upside-down weird kingdom principles are going to be seen in the Benjamin generation. But the Benjamin generation of grace, truth, time, and power is the fulfillment of head and heart and meal and oil and word and spirit. And thank God, God is always faithful. Say amen. amen. Is Jacob going to let Benjamin go? My God, my God. Genesis forty-three fifteen. So the men took the gifts... And the double amount of silver and Benjamin also. And they hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward, Take these men to my house and slaughter an animal and prepare a meal. They are going to eat with me at noon. Verse 24, the steward took the men into the house and gave them water to wash their feet and provided fodder for their donkeys. And they prepared their gifts for Joseph's arrival at noon because they had heard that they were to eat there. Verse 26, when Joseph came home, they presented to him the gifts that they brought into the house and they bowed before him. This is the second bow. There are going to be five bows. He asked them how they were, and he said, How is your aged father you told me about? Is he still living? Verse 28, they replied, Your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down and prostrated themselves before him, the third bow. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son. Oh, my, my, my. Here's the full-blooded brother he's been longing for for 22 years. Boy, when you long for something for 22 years and it finally sits in front of you, that'll draw, I don't know, maybe some tears. As he looked about and saw his brother Benjamin, his own mother's son, hear those words, put them on your heart because this is about to happen to you. Joseph says, is this your youngest brother, the one you told me about? And he said, God be gracious to you, my son. Deeply moved at the sight of his brother, Joseph hurried out and looked for a place to weep. And he went into his private room and he wept there. Seven times, the Bible says, Joseph wept. These are the tears associated with fulfillment. Did you notice the first time he cried in chapter 42, verse 6? The ten brothers came, and they didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. And in the recognition of them, it says he wept, but this time he weeps. Because there is the dream. All 11 brothers, for the first time, in 22 years are in one room. Beloved, did you know that you may be just one brother away from the fulfillment of all of your destiny? One component away. And the devil says, kill yourself. 
don't kill yourself when all the giants that you've slain and thrown behind you had left only one giant in front of you. There's just one more. The devil said, no, there's 100,000 more ahead of you, and you're going to have to kill those and throw those behind you too. Well, the devil is a liar. Quit consulting him in all your judgments. Well, we've heard all of the church people. Now, what does Satan say? Satan, what, what do you have to say about the matter? And that's the voice we listen to in most cases. Well, we've heard the brethren, but I don't know. This strange guy in the suit here it really made a lot of sense. Jo Joseph weeps because he is confronted with his brothers and they still don't know who he is. He hasn't revealed himself yet, but he sees what he probably had forgotten, whatever really happened. Did you know something about dreams is when they come to pass you, you pinch yourself. You don't even believe, you don't even believe they're happening. You'll talk to yourself. You'll deconstruct the whole situation. You're the most cynical person in the world. Oh, you can believe God's going to bless everybody. Oh, God bless Uncle Harvey. You really believe that, but you don't ever believe he's going to bless you. Like Dorothy, I don't think there's anything in that big black bag for me. You know. Well, I hope it's a better gift than a diploma. <laughs> I remember I'd seen it as a child about 14 times before I went giving someone a diploma. It doesn't make them smart. Anyway. So you don't really believe, so, but here's the, there's a surreal element. Here's Joseph. He, he's sort of just been faithfully doing the next right thing in his 13 years in prison. He, I think he just sort of forgot his dreams. And if that's not bad enough, he had two guys come into the prison, and he prophesied their dreams. Remember? The baker, he said, you're going to die in three days. Then he said, the cupbearer, you're going to be restored to Pharaoh. And then he did his scramble. Uh, please, I'm here unjustly. I didn't do anything wrong. When you get back to Pharaoh, please remember me. Okay, thank you so much. Here's my ministry card, and here's my best sermon this year. And it says the cupbearer was released, restored to Pharaoh, and he forgot all about Joseph. And that's, you can be faithful and forgotten. Isn't that how funny how quick people forget? I mean like that. You know, I think I was uh, married to you for 45 years and I've been faithful all these years. Yeah, I've forgotten. Yeah, whatever. So whatever. Beloved, he had forgotten, I think, in the midst of his faithfulness because, you know, dreams can torment you. If you just keep keeping them in front of you all the time, it, it's just like, ow. But here he is. The brothers are brought in. I want you to see what happens. As soon as Benjamin comes on the scene... They don't get bread, they get meat. Everything's, the fruitfulness starts right away. They're coming for grain. They just want, could we have some grain? You know, dry grain. Could we have some grain? They're invited to the prime minute, to the grand vizier's house for dinner, and they don't get bread, they get meat. It's already starting to flow. Secondly, they come in, and they're seated according to their birth order. And they're all looking at each other. Did you know when, when Benjamin shows up, their order comes out of chaos? When the Benjamin generation comes on the scene, order is going to come out of chaos. They chaotically walk in the room and are seated according to their birth order, and they start getting goosebumps. There it is. <laughs> Ear tingling. <laughs> Did you realize that we're seated according to our birth order? <laughs> but you know what's also happening at the table? Absolute rank prejudice. The Egyptians hated the Jews, and they hated more than anything else Jewish shepherds. Pharaoh himself said, I'm going to put you in Goshen because i got to get you guys as far away. Because the children of Israel are sacrificing to their God the animals the Egyptians worship. Can you think about that? We're going to give our offerings unto the Lord. Not here. <laughs> because they've got a God or a goddess associated with what they're sacrificing to Jehovah. So they, the Bible says that they come into the table. Now, let me, let me, let me just, you, you've got to get this. Put flesh and blood on this. Joseph comes in and they give him gifts. They bow a third time. 
It says he looked about them and he saw them and he went and wept. And after that, he washed his face and he came out and controlled himself saying, serve the food. Verse 32 said they served him by himself, the brothers by themselves and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves because Egyptians could not eat with Hebrews for that is detestable to the Egyptians. Now, I want you to notice something. Benjamin is revealed in the midst of a famine, a worldwide famine. Secondly, they're seated at a table with rank prejudice. You think we're looking at prejudic a prejudicial spirit in our age? Square that. They're sitting at their table. The Egyptians are sitting at their table. Nobody eats the same food. Everybody is in a cold, hateful silence looking across the room at their perceived enemies. <sighs> David said in Psalm 23, Thou preparest a table for me in the presence of my enemies. God's going to make your enemies sit so close to you, right across from you, that they are just forced to watch you eat. Well, that might be a little nice. Could I start with some orange juice? Thank you so much. Oh, you're not having anything. I forgot. I'm sorry. God loves that. Now, we're not to be that way, but God loves comeuppance. He loves, he says, sit them at their table and put them right across from their enemies. And so in the middle of all this rank prejudice and everybody's figuring out who's the devil and your group's the devil and I'm with my group, my pro group and your anti group and here we are seated. And then the prime minister decides he is going to send from his table all of his food over these filthy Jewish shepherds. Now they got to act nice. Hi. Did you know the prime minister? For long? You know, it's like, Gah. do you see how God loves to wait for a room to be so polarized that he comes right there in the middle of it and goes, are y'all uncomfortable? Are y'all horribly uncomfortable right now? Fantastic. And you all know you're right, right? And the other guy's wrong and everybody's in your ditch, hating one another, throwing hate bombs over. Good. Now I'm coming in. And now you have to give obeisance to my people. Oops, you're wrong. Bow down. Oh, that's a nasty bow. Remember in the movie Ever After with Drew Barrymore? The last scene, Angelica Houston, her wicked stepmother who has been rude and crude and has never shown her any love, now has to bow at the end. And it is the longest, most torturous taking of a knee I've ever seen in my life. And she has to bow before, before that woman is queen and acknowledge that she's the queen. <laughs> and everybody's saying, should we kill her? She goes, no, 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 no leave her alive. Leave her alone. Sometimes it's worse to be left alive. In the next scene, they're down in the basement, and they have to clean all the bedclothes. Oh, boy, oh, it's a comeuppance moment. Ever after, go take a look at it. That's what's happening in this room. They still don't know who Joseph is, but my Lord. And it says Benjamin had five times the food of his brothers. He's getting five. He's given five times the linen garments in Genesis chapter 45, verse 22. He's given five times the portions, Genesis 43, 34. Be decked and spoiled when the Benjamin generation shows up. It's not bread. It's meat. It's not just meat. It's God preparing your meat and serving it to you in the presence of your enemies, and they have to watch it and approve of it. Take a look at the culture. Ring any bells? Ding, 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 ding. The Benjamin generation is walking in any minute. Because God doesn't wait for conflict to lift. He intensifies it, and then he walks in the middle of it and goes, how y'all doing? Are there any problems in here? I'm feeling a lot of hate. Where's the love? Come on. Whenever Jesus, our Lord, walked in a room to preach, 50% of the people hated his guts and said he had a devil. 50% worshipped him. Now that's a divided room. And that's what we have for the first time in my lifetime. An absolutely divided room, 100%. Right down the middle. 
and you go, that's terrible. No, 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 it's delicious. Cheer up, saints. It's getting worse. That's the environment into which the Benjamin generation walks up and into. How you doing? <laughs> What's your name? Benjamin. Benjamin. And he has a ministry of reconciliation, and he has a ministry of tears, and he has a ministry when he shows up. <sighs> it's not corn, it's meat. Oof. And, he, and he gets five portions. They're not expecting this, and they still on their end of the table don't know what's going on. You know, you want to be in control of everything, right? I know you. I'm looking at you. Yeah, I know you do. They, they have no control. They are being seated in their birth order by a guy who's been mean to them up until now, it appears. And now that all 11 of them are together, all things start working together for good to those who love God. Oh, beloved, there's a turnaround coming. Things are about to get good for you. It, it, to a degree that's going to make you uncomfortable. And, and, and the Lord loves to see us cringe. Just a little bit. How's that, how's that blessing fitting you? I'm a little uncomfortable. I'm a little, a little dry here. I'm not feeling quite fitting. Yeah, yeah, we don't know what to do with blessing. You wouldn't know what to do with personal blessing. <laughs> That's why sometimes it, he makes us wait for it. So that it won't kill you when it comes. So here we are seated. Joseph has to take potty breaks to weep. Because he just realized when Benjamin shows up in this encounter that his dream is fulfilled. He saw all 11 brothers bowing before him. Fulfillment is a delicious thing. What is fulfillment going to look like for you? Benjamin, what's it going to taste like? What's it going to feel like? Well, I don't want to think about it. It's going to hurt me. Well, eh, think about it. Think about it. Think about it, beloved of the Father. Think about it. The Father adores you. He loves you. He's spoiled you. He's hugged you. He's kissed you. He's filled you up. He's birthed you for this hour, and it's the peak of a famine, and you're just about to have your moment. We'd like to introduce Benjamin. I've told you the story before. I, it just marked my life. I'm 13 years old. I have my performing outfit on. I have a guitar, and I'm behind the curtain, and the, and the guy goes, and look out, Wayne Newton, and look out, Glenn Campbell, because here comes Craig Campbell. And I'm standing there like a goofball with my guitar, and the lady goes, I think that's you. Go, go. I said, that's not my name. Craig Campbell, go. And I, I looked out from behind. Let them know you're coming. Let them know you're coming. I look out from behind. And it, all 12 people start clapping like, oh, Craig Campbell. I am Craig Campbell. Good. Well, <laughs> love one, I promise God won't mispronounce your name. <laughs> but I want you to see Benjamin's effortless presence. We never hear him say a word. And you know the only thing we ever see him do? ever in the Bible, is cry with Joseph. That's all he's said to do, is cry. And then they would arm wrestle, and he had a really strong uh, right arm. No. The, the Bible says he's the only son born in Canaan, the promised land. He's the only son named by the father directly, and all we see him do is cry. Why? Because the Benjamin generation is going to trigger tears. Holy tears. I've got a beautiful friend named Vicki Vaconis, and she's written a book on trusting your body because your body's always talking to you and telling you things. She does, she's an osteopath. She does um, all kinds of amazing things. She's in a little room. It's just a tiny little room. And I went in one time for a treatment and she had laid face down there. And, and as soon as she began to 
do her acupuncture. And she started telling me about my life, and I started crying. I'm not going to cry on somebody's table. Oh, you'll cry. Beloved, there are some things coming up that have nothing to do with your diet and even nothing to do with your health and have nothing to do. They're simply tears that need to be released. I'm not going to cry about anything. Oh, yes, you will. When the precious presence of the Holy Ghost comes in, you cry, you'll bark like a dog if you need to. You'll shriek. You know, the meetings of Jesus were not kosher meetings. I don't know how these denominational folk don't see and Philip the Evangelist in Samaria, when their meetings happened, people were shrieking because evil spirits were coming out of every other person. These folk are howling. These are not stayed worship. And now Psalm 32, shall we rise and say, the shrieks, screams, demons saying, we know who thou art, the Holy One of God, and Jesus saying, shut up, be muzzled, and come out and hurt him not. Hey, this was church. Why all things must be done decently and in order. Yeah, whose order? Heaven's order? They're throwing crowns all over the place. Whose order? When Benjamin effortlessly shows up, and there, there it is again. This is the beloved generation. This is the generation of grace, truth, time, and power. All Benjamin does is ever recorded, we ever hear him, is crying. Because when two blood brothers finally recognize one another and those tribes unite, there are mixed tears. Joseph's tears mixed with Benjamin's tears. And then everybody starts getting a blessing. Everybody starts getting delivered. The brothers are sitting there. They don't know what's going on, except we know one thing. They are smitten with guilt. All of them are looking at each other going, this has something to do with what we did to Joseph 22 years ago. They're all looking at each other going, this is come up. They're even saying it in front of Joseph because they think he's Egyptian and doesn't understand Hebrew. The whole time Joseph's having to take potty breaks to cry is because he's overhearing his brothers going, oh, we're going to get it. Now Reuben speaks up and says, remember what happened? I told you not to throw him in that pit. This is God. And Joseph's overhearing all this. Won't that break you up a little bit when you overhear people find out about what they said about you or did against you is wrong? Well, Craig, they're dead. They can't say it. God can still bring you the tears that you need to encounter. They can come up and they can come out in any form they need to take to release you. I've been in services where people have wept for four solid days hours over their hurts, over the losses regarding their parents, the family of origin they were raised in, the wounds that they sustained, and that isn't book knowledge, and that's not left brain neck up, and that's not, well, even seeing a formal counselor, that can be anal. Hi, my name's Rex, I'm your counselor. Let's get acquainted a little bit. No, you can even have a bad counselor that'll help you force the beach balls deeper. <laughs> you know, if Rex is all God has, I'm going home unhealed. How about the rest of you? <laughs> Henceforth, all bad therapists are now Rex. He means well. Tell me a little bit about you. But before we do, let's talk about me. You know, it's like, oh, God, how much an hour? Uh, Zoom and call. We need the Holy Spirit to bring those tears up. Amen. Someone say amen. D -d -d tears. Tears. The diamond dust of the kingdom of God. The language God understands. We call it liquid prayer. That's what we need in this house. And God is allowed to do it in this house because I will forego anything for people to be facilitated to have an environment where they can sob and they can weep and they don't have to be guarded because they're completely secure and guarded. That's what the Benjamin generation is going to facilitate. The Be a Benjamin is a man, woman, boy, girl, whatever age that can sit next to you and not interrupt your tears and your need to cry. You know, when someone's sobbing, even with worship, you need to get some instrumental worship. Because once you stick words to worship, 
it start, you, you start getting in your left brain. We call it soaking worship. Just get some instrumental worship that you can get in. And then that Benjamin anointing will come because as soon as some people start singing in worship, they pull you out of the anointing. Let's talk about Jesus. Uh, hey, get out of that anointing over there. Push those beach balls back down. I'm talking. See, your brain <laughs> is engaged once the words come in. Now, I'm not against words, you know. He hates Hillsong. <laughs> Just try some soaking worship for a while. Get out of your left brain. Amen? Uh, <laughs> All right, and stay away from staid, boring church services. Right, walk in Jesus. When you need to sob unto death, you need some soaking worship. Jason Upton in the background, but extract the the words. <laughs> soaking worship, holy moments, a holy place. You know what I'm talking. It's coming. The tears are coming. Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin. Why? Because Benjamin's there. See, I, I, I hate to keep talking about when I was a boy, but when I was a boy, when I would walk in the room, this started happening. Didn't know the Bible to save my life. Horribly embarrassing with regard to my biblical scholarship. But when I walked in the room, people started crying. And I wasn't, I didn't know enough to quench, quench it and try to impose an order on the service. I just let them cry. So we're going to cry tonight, I guess. hundred people sitting in a room staring at me like waiting, like I've got a tap dancer. Okay, da, 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 da. And I said, no, we're just going to be quiet. And that's so awkward to see a hundred Christians be quiet. Because all the Pentecostals within 30 seconds of silence are going, Shut up, 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 up. they cannot handle quiet. They've got to shout out in a tongue. And I'd see them and I'd go, shh. Remember years ago, Lonnie Frisbee, a man mightily used of God to start the Vineyard Movement, the Calvary Chapel Movement, he would get up on a chair and like stand there for 10 minutes. Do you know how long 10 minutes is? When you're a preacher sweating on the platform back here and the service is it's gotten going anywhere and Lonnie's standing on a chair and it's getting real tense for the professionals on the platform. Dead air is it, just one minute is hard enough. Ten minutes, nothing's been said. And you can see them sweating, pulling their preacher socks up starting to t decide who's going to like go and break this up and take this up. And the Holy Ghost would come after 10 minutes. <sighs> Just like a cloud in the room. Everybody starts sobbing. Everybody starts come running to the altar and begging forgiveness and opening their heart to Christ. And <sighs> Lonnie, just lay hands on him. Just lay hands on him. It was a holy disordered mess in the natural but it was everything coming together in all these people's lives because that Benjamin anointing brought tears. The tears don't have to mean tears of sobbing because we'd sit next to people for two hours that were howling hysterically with tears of delight. God's changing the nature of our tears, but Benjamin just, so he just comes in and they don't just get corn, they get meat. And they don't just get seated, they get seated in their birth order. And they don't just get seated in their birth order, but they're getting the food sent from the prime minister's table. And they have to, all their enemies have to watch them get blessed. And Benjamin gets five times what the other brothers are getting. Now hear this, Joseph is setting them up. See, last time they saw a little brother that was highly favored and got more than they got, they wanted him dead. Joseph wants to know if they've changed. Did you know you've got to give people the grace to change? Because all the last memory you have of them is the last memory you have of them. And, and nobody's the same person in the last five years, the last two minutes sometimes. Nobody's the same person. You have one frozen memory of them being a complete idiot. And it's a legitimate memory. They were like flying midair with a toilet on their head. Okay? They were... They were nuts. And from that point on, you have been telling the toilet head story. 
I suppose he still has his head shoved up a toilet somewhere. All right. You got to <laughs> you got to give grace loved one. He's not still midair with a toilet on his head. He realized the next morning that that's the dumbest thing he's ever done and he's not the same person. Give him room to change. Well, Joseph is giving room for his brothers to show what they really are because he's going to give Benjamin five times the food, five times the linen garments, and then he's going to send them back to their father and he's going to hide his silver cup in Benjamin's bag. Now, they think he is a diviner. They think he has a psychic gift. Do you see this? How else would he know how to seat them in their birth order? They don't know who this guy is, but he's freaking them out. Because he seems to know everything about him, and he's, and, he's, and he's messing with them. And now he sends them home with grain. And then he says to the steward, now put my silver divining cup in the little boy's bag, in Benjamin's bag. And they're on their way home singing the praises of God. Well, our spirituality really got us turning that thing around, huh? I guess everything's fine. And they get on their way towards home, and then they're run down by the guards of Pharaoh. And uh, they say, you know, one of you stole the silver cup of the prime minister of Egypt. And whoever it is is going to be a slave forever. And the rest of you will be able to go. And they swear, you know, may the Lord kill all of us if we have stolen the cup. Well, they get to Benjamin's bag, they open it up, and there's Joseph's silver cup. Benjamin gone. Every, they didn't do anything wrong. But Joseph has set them up. Because he says, only the guilty one has to become my slave. The rest of you may leave now. Go ahead on home to your father. And he wonders, will they betray him like they betrayed me? They're given a chance. You can all go now. He's the slave. And Judah, his brother, in the longest speech in the Bible, runs up and says, Pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak a word to you, my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant. Though you are equal to Pharaoh himself, my Lord asked his servants, Do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, We have an aged father, and there is a young son born to him in his old age. His brother is dead, and he is the only one of his mother's sons left, and his father loves him. Then you said to your servants, Bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, The boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, Unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what my Lord had said. Then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us will we go down. And we cannot see the man's face unless the youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father, said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me. And I said, he has surely been torn to pieces, and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me, too, and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now if the boy is not with us when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound with the boy's life, sees that the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow, your servant, your servant guarantees the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please, let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in the place of the boy, and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? Do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph. 
when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him. And Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am thy brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. <laughs> Worst thing they could ever hear in their lives. <laughs> they are ever been frozen what's next is all they're thinking because all they can think is what <laughs> and before that a lot else I'm the one you sold into Egypt and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been a famine in the land and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping but God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for you a remnant on the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Whew. What a relief. They're in shock. Beloved, the Benjamin generation is going to have to get used to being astonished and shocked at the goodness of God. Because Benjamin's presence is the linchpin and the key that triggers grain to meat. Every blessing one can conceive of with regard to fruitfulness. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me a father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, your children your and grandchildren, your flocks, your herds, and all you have, and I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute my lord can you believe this the tears triggered by benjamin's effortless presence were heard by pharaoh himself there are some things benjamin that you've been praying about and you've been shedding tears about and pharaoh himself is going to be impacted by those tears. Benjamin was the strongest, smallest tribe with the strongest anointing. You're going to influence your generation all out of proportion to your size and your talent and your one gift. I play the kazoo. Good, good. Play is something. It's not about your gift and your talent and your ability. It's about him. The only ability God requires is availability which he can rarely get with people who have a lot of abilities. That was worth the offering right there. Even you can be available, can't you? Sure. Wow. All of Joseph's dreams have come true in one day. There's the 11 brothers and you know what the Bible says? It says that they wept together, and it says that he and Benjamin wept on one another's necks, and then they had a great talk. Did you know after weeping, there's a lot of great talking that can happen that is regard to reconciliation. Tears first, reconciliation later. First, you've got to be seated at the hated prejudicial table, and by the end of the day, you're going to be slinging snot all over everybody. You're going to be crying like a baby. <laughs> Welcome to Bethel. <laughs> That's what I want here. I want God to be able to do whatever he wants to do. If he wants to knock you down on the ground, fine. If he wants to levitate you off the ground, fine. Anything. As long as we can see the long-awaited relief and release you've been looking for all of your life. You don't even know you're bound. You don't even know it. You've forgotten about it. You've frozen. You know, pain is frozen like uh, fish and ice. 
once you freeze it, it stays frozen until it melts. Then we go, what's that? <laughs> oh, that's a heartbreak I had when I was 14 years old. It's been frozen in the ice. Did you know God's slowly allows, allowing the sun to rise and slowly the ice is melting on that issue that you think that you've, you know, stuffed safely away with Superman in the ice cave? <laughs> Well, that's well buried. No one will ever see that. Make sure. <laughs> that's why it's better to resolve issues than to put them on ice because when the sun rises and it gets real hot, then everything starts coming back. Remember I said if you bury something, make sure it's dead. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. That ice melts. It comes screaming out. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were. Yeah, I know you thought. I've just been frozen all these years. Did you know the Lord is, is melting the ice? Huh? The Snow Queen is losing her power in Narnia, and her sleigh isn't gliding as easily. Remember that? Chronicles of Narnia. Little guy driving with her is looking down at the mud, and she looks at him, and he goes, No, no, I don't see any mud. <laughs> Plenty of snow on the ground. <laughs> The enemy's ice kingdom is melting. And what used to be a jagged piece of ice that could have killed you is going to be melted into water that, can, that you can drink, that will give nourishment to your garden. Isn't God amazing? He can bring a healing that will restore you. Benjamin, Benjamin, the Benjamin generation. I want that generation. Where are they? You're, you're looking. Look in the mirror. It's you. I'm, you'll be proud I got a third of the way through these notes. Let's just hit some high points as we close. The Benjamin generation's presence are going to trigger the release of cleansing tears. And by the way, as the ice melts, do you know what's going to be surfaced in order to be healed? Shh. Family secrets. There was a secret in this family that poisoned its very foundation, and it was that the brothers had betrayed Joseph and left him in a pit to die, and they didn't know whether he was alive or not. They all thought he was dead. Shh. They all agreed to share the secret. Do you know you're only as sick as your secrets? You're not at liberty to tell anybody else's secrets they share with you, but you are at liberty to tell your own. And uh, I'm not going to Rex, the counselor. Wouldn't tell that to anybody. I won't even tell that to God. <laughs> you ever done any stuff you won't even tell to God? Hey, God, you know, there's some stuff, but I just can't. <laughs> can't make eye contact. You know, all that stuff you can't make eye contact about. Don't worry, nothing new under the sun. I heard it all this week. Pastors hear everything, and then I have to go forget. People think I can just go forget. <laughs> then I was at the farm, and then I went out into the field. It's like, oh, please, don't. No, 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 I, I, no, no just don't tell me everything. And they did. It's okay. I've heard it all. God. Ew. Oh, did I say it out loud? I'm sorry. <laughs> Wear your sphinx face when you are counseling people. Because they will tell you things. And inside, you just do this. I'm sublimating that need to break into hysterical laughter. By touching this quarter in my right pocket, I'm sublimating all all of the need to fall down 16 flights of stairs in hysterical laughter by sublimating it. And then my quarter was gone. It wasn't in my pocket. <laughs> Excuse me, let me check my other pocket. <laughs> Sometimes you have to just sublimate it, right? Okay, anyway, that's going to be in the uh, counseling class coming up in the fall. All these glorious techniques. <laughs> I've been told some things. <laughs> I, had, I injured myself. I've harmed myself internally. 
I can't even say that out loud. Okay, I was going to give you a version of, of one thing I heard, but I, I'm not. All right, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> no, Gretchen, you would love it. I'll tell you later. <laughs> it's not dirty or anything. It's just a stupid thing that happened in my office once, and I, la I laughed at something someone said, and, and they actually meant it. So I thought it was a joke. Anyway, he's right back in complete control of the message. Look at that. You saw it? Did you see it happen? Want to see it again? The Benjamin generation will trigger bread, but not bread, but meat. The Benjamin generation will trigger some people. Ah, the Benjamin generation will trigger some people being put out in order that sacred intimacy will not be violated. What's the first thing Joseph did? He told everybody what? All the Egyptians, the haters, get out. What did Jesus do when when Jairus's twelve-year-old daughter died? It said he came to the house and the professional mourners that you paid by the hour were already going, ooh, ooh. You know, we have 10 more minutes till lunch. Ooh. They used to hire these fools to come in and scream. And Jesus comes in and Jairus is there and he sees the professional mourners and Jesus says, get, you guys, you need to get out because she's not dead. She's just sleeping. Only Jesus can say stuff like that. Isn't it true? He gets away with murder, doesn't he? She's not dead. She's sleeping, it says, and they laughed him to scorn. Isn't it funny how God is going to throw out the scorners because he's about to do some holy things and he needs holy ground for it and he is, he's going to pump out all that poison in this culture out of the room and he's got to get rid of it completely. He had to send those Egyptian scorners out because he was just about to do a holy unveiling which would have been defiled by their presence. Isn't it good that God's going to put some folk out that need to be put out? And by the way, it says he put everybody out that scorned him, and he let Peter and John go in, let mom and dad go in. See, he's, he's clear in the room for what he's about to do because he will not do holy things unless he has a holy place, and he will not always do intimate surgery in the presence of scorners. He put them out. And he also put him out to protect the nakedness of his brothers because he was just about to surface who he was and their sin, therefore, their beach balls of sin were going to come up and he did not want their dignity compromised by scorners hearing what they'd done. So he emptied the room. Isn't he wonderful? He protects your dignity with his own life. Do you know why the first miracle was done in John chapter 2? Do you remember what it was? Water turned into wine. Do you know what the significance of that is? The first sign and wonder he ever did as the, as the God-man on earth? It's because he was saving the dignity of a young couple whose family had run out of wine. And this would have put a mark on them the rest of their lives. They would have been the stupid couple who had no wine. And to save their dignity, he saves our dignity with his own life. And he said, go get those water pots and you fill them to the top and you take them to the governor of the feast. And the governor who is an expert and a connoisseur tastes it and goes, whoa, this is the finest stuff I ever drank in my life. Wait a minute. You always do this reverse. You don't wait till the last bit of the party when nobody's standing up to bring out Christ will protect your dignity. Don't you ever think God's going to embarrass you in public. One of the greatest prophets of our time died two years ago. And he told me that he, as a young boy, that he was just a menace with the gift that he had. He used to stand in front of a stadium of people. And he knew everybody's sins. His gift was he would know all your sins. Oopsie doodle. He said, I just walk up in a room and I can tell you what you did in the last 72 hours and every thought that went through your head. And I said, well, what use was that? He said, well, the offerings were good. <laughs> uh, or we'd like to pay the double fortune offering. Yeah, not to make all kind. But he told me, he's like 17, 18. He used to just bait. Like he'd see a man in the front row and he'd put the mic down and go, you want me to tell what I know right now about you? How about I just say it over this microphone? And he said, God should have struck me dead. 
he should have struck me dead. He said, I was just playing with this gift, you know, playing with it. Anywho, this move of God, I believe, is going to not be a sideshow and is not going to be ruined and wrecked by immorality and false teaching because the Benjamin generation are the epitome of balance. Balance. All right. Oh, beloved. Do you see Joseph forgiving his brothers? He forgives them quickly. He forgives them privately. He forgives them freely, unconventionally, and no provision associated with it. Completely, don't bother yourself anymore. It was God that sent me. You meant it for evil. He meant it for good. But don't cry anymore and feel guilty because I'm not going to hurt you. And they all wept together, and it says, and they talked. Oh, I don't know. I'm looking forward to some of those talks that happen after weeping. Oh, Lord, isn't God good? Aren't you glad that he didn't answer the prayers of those that wanted you dead? Oh, there's somebody at some point wanted you dead. God, if this wasn't the United States and it wasn't me, wouldn't be in a cell the rest of my life. I'd put him right down. The yeah, yeah. There's a lot of evil in our culture. By the way, it's called murder in the heart. You don't even need to do it. We can smell the murder coming out of your mouth. The look. You're just restrained. You know, civilization rests lightly upon you. You. Not them. Look at what people do when the chaos hits a culture. Oh, no, no. What you are capable of doing is beyond your own imagination. If you just get a gun put to your head, if you just lose everything you have, it's amazing what you'll find yourself doing. Because the Bible's right and somebody's wrong. <laughs> but in church, you're all fine now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're reading the Bible. Thank you. One setback and you'll be killing your neighbor, choking them to death. And it's like, oh, gosh, was that me? Yep. <laughs> the Bible's true about all this that it says about us. But the good news is that Jesus Christ, the greater Joseph, gave himself. And he says, don't weep anymore over your sins because I've been sent before you to save you. All this happened for me to be able to redeem my remnant. Isn't he wonderful? Don't you just love him more the more you know him? Well, like I told you, I'm taking my time with Benjamin. We're not even anywhere near. Next week's one of my favorite points, which you have to show up to hear. I want God to begin to confirm this word with signs and wonders following. And I want the Holy Spirit to revisit us. Can we be in agreement about that? I want this place to be a maternity ward where people can come and safely give birth to their dream or their vision or their ministry or their anointing and not be harmed. I want this to be an ER, and we are that ER, that can safely facilitate the birth of any of God's dream children. Father, we thank you for your goodness today. We thank you for the precious Holy Spirit that is unique to Benjamin and that you said that he's your beloved Lord. You said that he'll wear him on your neck and you carry him everywhere. You said that he would be next to you. You set his very lines of habitation within 30 miles, including Jerusalem and Mount Moriah. We thank you that our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross in the plot of Benjamin and he rose again in the plot of little Benjamin. Thank you, Father. Release your comfort to your children, Lord. Just in the middle of the night, let the tears come. Cleansing tears, healing tears, delivering tears, and we will not arrest them and stop them and put the brakes on. We will encourage them. And we'll scream into our pillow if we have to worry about being heard. We can always scream into a pillow. We can get in a car and go drive in the middle of the night and scream all over the place. Nobody's going to hear a thing. But we will cooperate with you, Holy Spirit, in being getting the vomit we need, the relief that we need, the release that we need to move further on in you. 
And may that be for all of your precious sons and daughters. In Jesus' name, someone say amen. Can we say yes to him? Just yes. We don't even need to know what we're agreeing to. Just sign the check. He'll fill it out. Now, what was it, uh, the amount that I just signed? None of your business. Just sign here. Sign here, 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 and here. Remember that? <laughs> and here. Elmer Fudd is just initialing everything. <laughs> oh, loved one, I've seen tears like that in a room. And I know how quick we are to quench that because it's uncomfortable and it's awkward and what's going on and it's charismania and it's the, no, no, it's just what was going on in that room when those 11 brothers got together. It says they wept so loud that Pharaoh himself heard it in the throne room. So it's going to get loud in our time. It's going to be heard all over the media, all over the world. Do you know Jesus said this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, and then shall the end come? Do you realize now is the only time in human history where that can happen? Whatever happens can be seen in simultaneity all over the earth within seconds. The whole world can see an arm grow on. The whole world can see a healing that starts. And then the next day, the whole world wants to be at that location. We live in a time where everybody's online. Nobody wants to be anywhere because they don't need to go anywhere. I, I'm going to be glad to see who wants to go somewhere when that glory taps down. You hear about it happening in Florida. There's a thousand people show up overnight in Florida. You hear about a move of God in North Carolina. A thousand people show up. I never as a young man had a hard time finding where God was moving in California. I drove 100 miles one way to see a ministry where the Spirit of God was filling out a little room. And it was always a dingy little middle-class house built in the 60s. You know what I mean? And you'd go, here? Is this where the Bible study is? <laughs> I found it. And I parked seven blocks away, and I was at first, I was in the front row. I used to sit all day from 6 a.m. in the morning till 7 at night to sit on the front row in the first chair to hear my favorite preacher that was anointed by the Holy Ghost. And I loved every minute of it. Didn't put me out at all. Do it again, Lord. Amen. We love you. We're here for you. All you have to do is go online, drcraigjohnson.org, and there's a thousand messages there for you like this. 24 hours a day, you just roll them. Just run them. And I guarantee you, there's not a dud in the bunch. All glory to God. Three in the morning, you can't sleep. Go online, click, and just let it run. And God will refresh you and encourage you. And can we thank God for Mike Fuller making all that happen and all that possible? Because of Mike, you're able to go on, and it's free. And it's free. And we encourage those of you not in the room because I know my givers are in the room and I know you, you can't squeeze blood out of a stone. You have all been faithful. But any of you that are new to this ministry, and let's say you just stumbled here. It just so happened. Well, if we feed you, you feed us. I got to write February and March's rent check. I got to pay a mortgage check. I got things I have to do in the next nine days. Those of you that have been faithful, we know who you are. God knows who you are. We're not talking to you. Any of our dear friends, our new friends, or maybe a new circle of love, uh, as God is widening our circle of love, and you don't go to church, and you don't tithe, and you don't do anything anywhere, you can be totally at home and comfortable feeding us as we feed you. Amen? That would be such a treat. You have no idea what a blessing it would be to let me, uh, I had to put a dump, bunch of my money in the church just to keep it where it's at. It would be so delicious to see some new friends say, we'll step up, we'll help. Anything is a blessing. Some won't give $20 because they say it's only $20. And everybody that could have given $20 would have paid every one of those bills, <laughs> but they talked themselves out of it. There is no gift too small. There is no gift too large. Whatever you can do if we feed you, you feed us. Amen. And you pray for us. If you have prayer requests, send them in. We will pray over your needs. Thursday evening prayer, we will have the saints pray over your personal needs. Go ahead and send those in. We love you. We're here for you. Be here for us. God bless you. We hope today's message has been a blessing to you. And if it has, please visit our website at drcraigjohnson.org. 
There you can find additional messages of encouragement. And if our ministry has been a blessing to you, please consider us in your ministry giving, as we depend solely on the financial assistance of our listeners like yourself. Also, please feel free to send any personal prayer requests. You can find us online at drcraigjohnson.org. God bless you.